Hi there, my name is Sandra and I will be speaking about restoring soils with fungi. Soils are so important, they feed us and they provide us with oxygen through plants. Fungi are so essential to creating soils with plants that there is nothing more important in this crucial time of history to speak up than to speak about this. Life begins in soil in the sense that we receive oxygen and all our food comes from soils. So what I would like to talk about is the history of soil formation, what is soil, soil carbon and its importance, root symbiotic fungi and their relationship in formation of soil, the soil food web, so all the life forms in the soil, and soil destruction, and at the end, the prospect of soil restoration. So Earth's history has once upon a time been dominated by fungi. About 400 million years ago, algae and fungi came out together in a symbiotic relationship as lichens and started producing oxygen. Giant fungi grew called prototaxites, potentially 10 meters tall. These decomposed rock and organic matter into minerals, forming first soils. So what is soil? It's a living thing. Plants and associated microbes utilizing sand, silt and clay. The function of store soil is to store carbon, produce biomass and oxygen, host biodiversity, the largest biodiversity on earth of any ecosystem, store and filter water and store and cycle nutrients. Soil carbon is so important. <clears throat> The way it works is that sunlight and carbon dioxide and water <clears throat> enter plants and what happens is they photosynthesize, so they convert the carbon dioxide into carbohydrates or sugars, plant sugars, releasing oxygen as a byproduct which we breathe in. We then release carbon dioxide and the cycle continues. That fixed carbon in the sugar form now travels down to the roots. These roots are associated with fungi that are closely intertwined around the root and spread out increasing its surface area. These are called mycorrhizal fungi or root fungi. Of course also the plant drops some debris onto the ground and there are other types of fungi called decomposers that actually degrade this wood, woody material and the leaves back into the nutrients, into the elements from which they are built. The mycorrhizal fungi then pick that up again and take it to the plant, feeding the plant nutrients back for the carbon they receive. So over eons, this relationship of fungi and plants, where one cannot exist without the other, has created giant pinnacles of perfection which we call rainforests. That's where Earth's biodiversity is held at its pinnacle. So these mycorrhizal fungi are symbiotic root extensions essentially of 95% of plants. See how they extend the absorption surface area of the, of the plant? You can imagine how much more water and nutrients can be gained by these tiny threads of mycorrhizal fungi of the tiny cells, thin cells, that can access any nook and cranny in the soil. The other great thing about mycorrhizal fungi is that they share nutrients and information between plants. In this image on the left you can see more mature seedling growing in the middle and tiny baby seedlings connecting into its network. So the middle seedling is actually sharing, it's, it's sharing this network with the babies. They hook into it and they all live happily ever after. This is what scientists call the wood wide web, where you can have one plant associated with many, many plants through this symbiotic relationship, through many different fungi on their roots. In this case here, we have just one type of a species of plant and the mother tree is connected to 47 other trees of its, of its species with just one type of mycorrhizal fungi. 
of course, if you multiply number of species in a forest and each of them have multiple different types of fungi on their roots, you can imagine how this network becomes very, very dense. And it is, has been reported that there's four tons of mycelium of this network underground per person. Another benevolent thing that these fungi do is they share nutrients with each other, not just with, with the same species. So, for example, when Douglas fir on the right is in winter time, it's still photosynthesizing, it doesn't lose its leaves. The birch by then in winter time has lost leaf matter and can no longer photosynthesize. So the Douglas fir transfers its nutrients through mycorrhizal fungi and the fungi feed this birch for its survival. So sharing really is caring in this scenario. The same happens in climate change. As species become intolerant of heat in northern hemispheres, other species come that are more tolerant of heat and actually are introduced into the ecosystem and can survive better. And the existing primary trees that are dying are now passing on these nutrients and carbon all of their nutrients and including carbon to these newcomers. This ensures that the survival of the forest, very important. So the wood wide web in fact is not competition but cooperative and equally dis equal distribution of resources within the community. It is not survival of the fittest that fits this paradigm but coexistence from promoting biodiversity. So let's look up the mycelium uh, close up we have a, 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 a hyphae of those cells coming off. That's a root. And the root is covered in those thin cells of, of the fungi. And completely covering it up, they extend into the soil and bring nutrients back to the plant. And this is another way of looking at the mycelium, just seeing how eventually it becomes like a network. And we call that the mycelium. So these mycorrhizal fungi, feed the plant phosphorus, nitrogen and other elements which are not present. We cannot add those to the soil. There are minerals and vitamins and things that bacteria produce that nothing can feed to a plant other than these fungi. In exchange, the carbon or the sugar from the plant then flows to the fungi, feeding uh, the entire ecosystem in the soil. Here are some hyphae which have carbon in them. You can see the carbon there. And it's reported that up to 70% um, of the carbon that is coming from a plant is, is not within its trunk so much, but within the roots and the microorganisms surrounding the root system. So soil has three times as much carbon than the atmosphere and four times as much as vegetation. Therefore, it's a perfect way to mitigate climate change by improving this carbon sequestration into soils. Hyphae hold soil particles together here as well. You can see that very well. And this little aggregate that form, these little aggregate soil aggregates that form then become macro aggregates or become larger. And here you can see around the root a representation of what is there. So we have these red blotches, which is organic matter being decomposed by saprophytic or decomposer fungi. That also feeds the soil creatures that are in there. And then we've got these green extensions which are the hyphae of the mycorrhizal fungi and they of course bind the whole uh, aggregate together and there are of course soil particles in there and there are also organisms and of course when the aggregate is well formed it becomes quite large but look at all the pores and wormholes where animals can go through and everything's moving inside and this is what the key is soil biodiversity these fungi and associated other microbes feed the entire soil ecosystem. And there are such large plethora of organisms living within the living soil. And you can see that on the right as well, these little, these aggregate soil particles coming together create spaces and pores for water to be held in the soil, as well as giving it structure, as well as allowing some air to be present in the soil so that conditions remain optimum for other life to, or for soil life to form and stay connected to the system. So once again, he, it's all about the soil food web. It's all about biodiversity. We have the sun um, 
and carbon dioxide being taken up by plants and then mycorrhizal fungi taking those nutrients to other plant to other uh, organisms be it bacteria at the first um, instance other fungi but also little worms pick up some of that and then as they eat the fungi and the bacteria uh, these nematodes then release nutrients and those nutrients are then pumped back to the plant and so on as the organisms eat each other this food web this soil food web enables the formation of fantastic um, soil but all of the nutrients being locked up not in the sand and the silt but really within the, oh, those organisms and that's what drives the life in the soil until we get to higher animals higher up on the food chain which are also fed through the system so it is a very essential system that we must look, to, look after just to show you some of the characters that live in soil we have tiny bacteria that can only be viewed with a powerful microscope we have protozoa as well which are these unicellular organisms that you can see filter food and absorb things and eat bacteria and it's really cool looking at them there are three different types and it is reported that less than 0.1% of all soil organisms have been identified and described. So can you imagine the amount of biodiversity that is under the unknown to us? There we go, we fly to the moon, but do we look at what's under our feet? <laughs> so nematodes are really cool as well. They require oxygen in the soil. So when you have them in your soil, that's a very good indication that you have good compost or soil. They are tiny, tiny little creatures. You cannot see them with a the naked eye. You must look at them under the microscope also. There are also mites as well. So all this is feeding and churning and pooing and releasing nutrients into the soil. This is all necessary. We also have little springtails, which are so adorable. They are more macroscopic. Now we're looking at these first insects that are quite visible. So all of this once created the, the, the ecosystem was flourishing so much that it covered the entire of Australia with with um, with rainforest, the pinnacle of biodiversity. So up until for like hundreds, hundred million years, this was happening up until quite recently, and it was older actually, like ten times than the Amazon. And now there's only three percent of all the forest remaining that is actually rainforest, and that's in patches. This connected underground network has been disturbed, and has been cut, and has been damaged. And this is absolutely not good for anyone. In Australia, we have the world's fifth highest rate of clearing, which is very, very sad. It's, it's in, on par with uh, developing countries, in fact. And 20% of our carbon emissions come from clearing. 85% of clearing um, occurs in Queensland. And just to show how this actually then looks is that most of our soil is now poor and it's actually eroded so we have huge erosion issues and if we look at the land use and what is highly correlated with degradation of soil is how we farm it so you can see all the yellow on the right hand side image is that it is grazed in southeast Queensland alone and this is the entire almost continent that is grazed to that extent and you know, there's some other uses of land, like urban, uh, urban of obvious, obviously urban use, but it is the clearing of the land for cattle grazing and sheep grazing in particular in the rest of the country that creates these problems. And I'll explain why in a second, but just look at how 50% of all cattle in Australia are actually living in Queensland. So we have a conundrum, 50%, 55% of Australia's rainforests exist in Queensland and 50% of all cattle. So there is definitely a connection and we can see now why 85% of land clearing happens in Queensland. The problem with this is that as cattle graze extensively, not only do they damage the soil with their hooves, because Australia doesn't have animals that are hooved, they also... The, the grazing pressure is so high at times and they're so stressed as well, these animals, that they need to keep and they keep eating. They need to keep eating and more nutrients are required. And as they deplete the soil, there's less nutrients. So they eat more and they graze plants to very minimal um, as, until very little root is left. And that kills the soil, essentially. And all the plants that are trying to come up as well, like rainforest species seeds and other 
forest seeds that are under the ground, they get grazed as well. So no recovery is really possible once this happens. The soil turns to desert, essentially. You remove the root, you remove the carbon, um, liquid carbon coming from the plant. There's no life in the soil being fed and you basically start creating such conditions as the desert. Here in outback Queensland, we have trucks and trucks coming in to try and feed the dying cattle on the landscape because, you know, with, with hay and because there's just nothing for them to eat in drought times. But the good news is that we can reverse all this. And here comes the best way to reverse it is to restore the soil with a vascular mycorrhizal fungi. So this is a tiny little component of the fungi feeding the plant and receiving nutrients from the plant inside a plant cell and all the little hyphae that you can see sticking out it looks like a little tree therefore called arbuscular arba meaning tree scula meaning tiny and this is the absorptive surface there and 80 percent of all plant species have this symbiotic relationship when it but if it hasn't been removed by current agricultural systems and spraying of pesticides of course this contributes 54 um to 900 kilograms of soil carbon per hectare. That's a lot of um, carbon being sequestered into the soil through these fungal systems. And But just 1% increase in soil carbon can remove 154 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare and add 144,000 litres of water in per hectare. So this is definitely where we should be heading. Getting our plants inoculated, getting rid of pesticides and chemical agriculture, fertilizers and allowing these systems to flourish. So here we have this arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi forming glomalin on the left, which is all colored in green, and it can store carbon for about a hundred years in the soil. It's a sticky molecule um, that creates uh, food for all the creatures around the root, but also it binds soil together, it sticks and it stays there for long periods of time prevents erosion, absorbs moisture. It's endless possibilities of what, it has endless benefits to the soil. There are also types, types of fungi called melanized endophytes on some roots. And they can store in the melanin, as the plant roots die and the um, fungi also die, they leave this, this really um, brown substance that can sequester um, 130 tons per hectare per decade of carbon and it leaves it there for up to thousands of years in the soil and this is a great potential of course to look at these fungi and to start working with them on, on our landscape. So this can then restore degraded and polluted soils, increase biomass and biodiversity, store and filter surface and ground water and offset our annual, um, one third of our annual emissions out of the atmosphere into the soils. So mycorrhizal fungi in agriculture are so important because they feed the um, liquid carbon to microbes. They the nitrogen that's fixed through bacteria goes back into the plants through these systems. All these minerals and, and um, are fed back to the system as well into the plant. There's carbon storage in molecules such as humus, and then there's water diverse uh, delivery and efficiency that's happening. So it's, there's drought tolerance, and you have, of course, plant immunity as well. No pesticides, no requirement for any fertilizers. Nature has been doing this for millions of years. There's no reason why I can't keep going. We can help plants by inoculating them with um, mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see, of course, greater yield in corn here and its roots. Potato yields increase, tomatoes. Every plant you look at, there's also an increase in, um, in yield. So no inputs, no expensive costs, no pollution. And you've got this amazing... Uh, recovery of soil and you can do this at home <laughs> you can isolate some of these spores from um, of these fungi colonize root fragments put them into potting um, mix uh, with your plant and then check if the mycorrhization has occurred and if it has you put your plant out into the field and this will keep going as long as your soil is looked after and moist and has you know um, good organic matter in there already. So this is possible. This is, and of course, these mycorrhizal fungi will build up the system as as we kept, keep adding them. And once they're there and they're being looked after through several other methods of um, care of these soils, uh, we can then um, have regeneration. 
So one of the ways to do that is to uh, practice no tilling, so no disturbance of the soil, so you leave the fungi in there. Um, use mycorrhizal cover crops, so use crops that are symbiotic with these um, uh, fungi. And never leave the soil bare, of course, keep covering it up with plants that will keep, keep feeding the fungi. Don't use any fertilizers, they will kill your fungi. You can compost uh, manure and, uh, and compost and basically add that as an amendment to the soil for, for a while before everything starts kicking in and dropping its own manure. Um, and leave the residue, basically just plant straight into the residue. And this will sequester up to a thousand kilograms of carbon per hectare per year. And of course, having non-monocultural systems such as multistrata agroforestry and syntropic farming this is the way to go, increasing biodiversity in soils um, by having biodiversity of plants and becoming making our farm lands into forests, basically farming within forests. Now, one great example of um, such a sort of a recovery process has been Woodfordia, um, the, the land where the Woodford Folk Festival is held. In the, it was used to be a dairy farm for a very long time, but, you know, and um, in the early 1990s, it has been bought and the planting festival started to put out a lot of plants into the ecosystem so that people have a beautiful um, experience while at the festival and shade while they're camping and uh, biodiversity research can happen, which is what I'm leading at the moment um, there. Lots of great things can happen. And of course, this was a dry, dry, very depleted landscape and now quite bare as well. Um, there were some plants, but now it's flourishing with biodiversity because 20 years or so worth of planting of rainforest plants creates this intense um, experience. Really, it's just very touching to the heart. And I'm leading mycology research project there as well, where we're looking at collecting fungi, looking at them, identifying them, isolating some of the roots and putting them into the nursery, all kinds of things to apply this knowledge and teach people how to do it and how to work with the landscape. So I invite you to join me and I invite you to, you know, to have any questions raised with me if you are into this sort of thing and if you enjoyed this presentation. And basically, um, yes, you can contact me um, on Facebook via myco-mania or just find my name um, and look me up on Facebook. Um, but in Mycomania, I just post a lot of cool, fungi stuff. Or just email me at sandra at woodfordia.com. Thanks so much and enjoy. Uh, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. And I hope uh, that this is something that you might use in the future to help restore the earth. See ya.